Hello, this is Jake MD, and today I'm going to talk about risks of general anesthesia. And I have a couple graphics to kind of help um, understand why some of the most common risks are present. Um, first one I like to talk about is the sore throat that you get after general anesthesia. And that's mostly due to the breathing tube that's placed to help secure your airway and make sure that um, you can breathe adequately while you're under general anesthesia. And the reason why you have that problem along with um, possibly a fat lip or a cut lip or um, possibly losing a tooth or cracking a tooth is because of the instrumentation the way that we place that breathing tube which you should be able to see from the picture I have here so these are called Macintosh blades they're metal they have a little light source right here or here on this blade and that light source uh, makes it so I'll be able to see you deep into the back of your throat in order to place the endotracheal tube, which a uh, picture of that is right here. It's a plastic tube that goes in your um, trachea, which is your breathing tube right here that goes to your lungs. And that allows us to give you oxygen and inhaled gases to keep you asleep under general anesthesia. Um, this other tube here is your esophagus and that is definitely not where we want that breathing tube to, play, to go since that will inflate your stomach and make it more likely that stuff in your stomach can come up and you can have nausea vomiting or aspirate is what we like to call it and that's where particles from your stomach go into your lungs and that can cause a pneumonia and other bad things after anesthesia so going back to the blades and the reason why you get a split lip or damage to your teeth is basically from this metal blade um, connecting between your lip and your teeth. So it's pretty easy to, if you can imagine if your mouth doesn't open very wide that when you're placing that in that your lip could get snuck in between your tooth and that piece of metal and any pressure at all is likely to split your lips, especially because you probably have dry lips because you know, you're a little dehydrated from not having anything to eat or drink that morning or the night before. Um, and then the sore throat itself is from this little balloon that is poorly visualized, but it's right down here. And we inflate that to make sure that when we give air and push that air in, that it'll fill up your lungs and not just sneak right back out your throat. So that little balloon is very important to help us give you the oxygen and anesthetic acids you need, but also causes that sore throat. The other main risk of anesthesia that we think about is nausea and vomiting. And that's from a multiple different reasons why people get that. Um, being female gender, less than 40 years old, um, if you are a non-smoker, you're at higher risk of getting nausea and vomiting after. And there are types of surgery, amount of pain medicine you get, and different things that also influence your rate of nausea. And based on those risk factors, I determine how many antiemetic drugs I'm going to give you prophylactically just to try to eliminate that risk of nausea. And you're usually pretty good at limiting nausea, but it's definitely not 100%. So if you have nausea after surgery, make sure you let your PACU nurse know or your anesthesiologist know if they're in the area. Um, and they can give you some more medicine to try to treat that nausea or vomiting that you're having. Um, other risks of anesthesia that most people don't think about as much is the position that you're in for the surgical procedure can cause nerve injury. So if you have compression or you're laying in an unnatural spot, say like you're at home in real life and you get tingling in your leg from sitting at a specific position or you get that funny bone tingling sensation, um, and that's also pretty common after surgery and there's some that are higher risk than others but in general that's something that we think about and pad you very carefully after your sleep or not technically asleep but I'll talk about that in another lecture. 
Um, other risks of anesthesia are things that people worry about a lot but are actually pretty uncommon. That's heart attack, stroke, and death. So uh, the heart attack and stroke risks are based a little bit on how healthy you are, how active you are, and what your background physiology is. So heart, main things that we think about for heart attack risk are things that you either can or can't control. Um, things that you can't control is having diabetes and being on insulin, having bad renal function or kidney function, and that would be either uh, creatinine greater than two on dialysis, um, those types of things. Um, having a previous heart attack or having a previous stroke, which are things you can't really do about anything about at all. The things you can help are to take your beta blocker medications if you're on them um, and to make sure that you are taking your medications as prescribed especially your ones for your lungs or your heart since that they will help optimize you and make sure that your physiology is in the best state it can be prior to surgery. Things that I do in the operating room to help are to manage your blood pressure, your oxygenation, your level of CO2 in your blood, and as well as your positioning and maintaining your body's physiology as close to normal as possible. Um, and those things all work together to try to keep you as safe as possible. That being said, somebody who has not had any of those problems, don't have diabetes, have normal kidney function, has not had a stroke or a heart attack, and can walk up two flights of stairs without any trouble, um, or at least without having to stop for shortness of breath, chest pain, or leg pain, so they're able to walk, even if it's slowly, um, up two flights of stairs, are probably in your lowest risk for cardiac outcome, cardiac problems, which is 0.4% is what we quote. And in reality, it's probably quite a bit lower than that for someone who's otherwise young and healthy. Um, and the other big quotation we say is for somebody who's having elective surgery, so a lower risk surgery um, without any substantial um, comorbidities or other medical problems, probably has about the risk of um, having a car accident when you're driving is probably about the level of risk that you expect under anesthesia. So pretty pretty safe, much safer than what you'd expect um, given how much people worry about that problem. I'd also like to briefly discuss why we don't want you to eat or drink prior to surgery. And most of that is to limit your risk of aspiration and that is where, again, where the context of your stomach go into your lungs. And that's a uh, risk that is with the induction of anesthesia, which is where you uh, um, lose consciousness. And that is a, a time when all of your muscle tone decreases and you're at a high risk of that stuff from your stomach coming up. And our regular guidelines are eight hours of fasting for a big meal, six hours for a light meal, um, four hours for breast milk, two hours for clear liquids. And clear liquids include like coffee with no sugar cream or anything added to it, just black coffee, um, water, apple juice, juices without any pulp. And there's different procedures that you'll have more stringent requirements for or certain hospitals have more stringent requirements. And a lot of times that those requirements are for places that you don't know if the surgery could go a little bit earlier or a little bit later. And let's say that the first procedure could take, uh, you're the second procedure of the day, and the first procedure could take um, an hour to four hours, depending exactly what they end up having to do. So they'd want to make sure that if the surgery lasts an hour, that the OR isn't stopped for another two hours while they're waiting for you to meet the MPO guidelines or the fasting guidelines before surgery. And all those things are designed to lower the um, 
risk that you'll get uh, pneumonia afterwards in case you uh, get some of that um, acid from your stomach into your lungs. And it doesn't take away the risk of that happening, but it can decrease the problems that occur if it does happen. And what I mean by that is if you aspirate a chunk of a steak into your lung, that is causing a lot more damage and harder for your lung to cope with than if you uh, just have some higher pH um, clear liquid fluid in in your lungs because that stuff gets absorbed a lot easier it doesn't cause huge of an immune reaction and it is actually a lot quicker and easier to recover from that in most circumstances so that's why we worry about particle size and particulates as well as have different guidelines for different lengths of for different lengths because of different things you eat and that's just all things to try to make anesthesia safer and help you get out of the hospital without having to stay for extra problems that came up because of something that we could have prevented. Postoperative cognitive dysfunction is another thing that we worry about in anesthesia. It's most um, likely in people who are over age 60, especially ones who have Alzheimer's or other cognitive dysfunction to begin with. And it's a fancy term, which basically means that the kind of wake up period that it takes for your brain to be back to its baseline state takes longer than it would normally be expected to take. And that could be anywhere from a few hours to a few days to up to a couple weeks. And unfortunately, we don't understand it that well. We try to use short-acting medications, avoid benzodiazepines, and try to do things like that to help get people back to their normal state as quickly as possible. But none of those things are a magic bullet that can make sure that we won't have a lasting effect or a longer-term effect than we'd like on people's cognitive abilities, um, especially in that elderly population that we talked about or mentioned. Um, things that we can do is avoid anesthesia if it's not completely necessary. So if there's an elective surgery that it would be something that would be nice to have, but something that's not actually needed, and you're worried about having problems with memory or cognition afterwards, that could be a reasonable thing to delay or not do at all. And it's something we're thinking about. Uh, most of the time, I think that the risk of that cognitive dysfunction is probably not worth canceling the surgery, but depending on um, the person and their thoughts about losing some time or not feeling like they are themselves, could mean a lot to them and it might be worthwhile for them to consider not doing that procedure because of it. I'm trying to alleviate some of the fears that people have since um, it seems to be a high anxiety state and just having surgery in general is a high anxiety state. So anything that we can do with education to kind of help make you feel better ahead of time I, thought, I think it's useful. Well thanks for listening.